Welcome to part 8 of my guide to video game history. Our story begins in 1981 when Atari secures a license late in the year to release Pac-Man on the Atari VCS 2600. Atari were desperate to get the home conversion out for the holiday season of Easter and summer holidays. This meant, however, that they needed the game to be developed in six weeks as opposed to the normal seven-month development time. But who would be able to write a decent game in that time? Step forward Todd Fry, who said he could do it and set to work. Halfway through development, he even stopped to hold Atari to ransom to arrange himself to have a share of the profits, a first for any Atari employee. By March 1982, the game was ready, and Atari manufactured 12 million cartridges. Now, when you consider that at the time only 10 million VCS consoles had been sold, that was quite a courageous decision. The game was released and looked and played awfully. The screen flickered, the character didn't look like Pac-Man, and the maze was different. Still, it had Pac-Man on the box, so initial sales were good, selling 7 million copies and making Todd extremely rich in the process. Much to the annoyance of other staff, he even would post up his paycheck with the commissions that he was earning around the office to rub his fellow employees' noses in it. Then, by summer of 1982, the game sales dried up, as word got around from gamer to gamer that it was a terrible game. Not only did this leave Atari and stores with millions of cartridges left unsold, but it also was a PR nightmare, with Atari's reputation being hit hard. Move on to late in 1982, and Atari did it all again, this time with another licensing deal with the new Steven Spielberg film, E.T., which was the biggest film of the time. The problem was that Atari wanted the game released this time for Christmas, which meant that there was only two months to create the game. Still high from his Yars, Revenge and Raiders of the Lost Ark success, Howard Scott Warshaw stepped forward for the challenge. The developer would only have five weeks to develop the game. The game was released and was an initial success, selling 1.5 million games for Christmas. But the game wasn't very good, being very dull to play, and soon customers were returning the game, wanting another game instead. By February, Atari still had 2.5 to 3.5 million copies of the game unsold, and sales had totally dried up. Legend has it that Atari eventually bulldozed all the unsold copies of E.T. and Pac-Man and concreted them up. By 1982, three years after Activision had started their own third-party game publishing, the market had exploded with numerous new game publishers being set up, all wanting a slice of Atari VCS's game money. The net result was a flood of games often quickly put together and being of poor quality, swamping the market. Gamers only had so much money and with no real way to know which game was good and which game was bad, buying confidence ran to an all-time low. When shop owners couldn't sell the games, they started to drastically slash the price of the games to shift them. This meant that new games released wouldn't sell at full price, forcing publishers to instead release quick, cheap games to compete and be able to survive. These poor games lowered customers' confidence even further. Also at this time, the home computer market had really started to pick up, with most parents opting to buy their kids a computer at a home that would prepare them for the brave new world, as opposed to a game console. By 1983, the games market in America imploded on itself, taking out most game publishers with it. Atari, who had made such costly mistakes on the Atari VCS, and had not appreciated that their game-producing market had dramatically shrunk thanks to third-party publishers such as Activision grabbing a percentage for themselves. The net result was by 1983, Atari recorded losses of more than $500 million, and the stock value plummeted by over a third. To make things worse, Ray Kassar, the CEO of Atari, had been kicked out for insider trading. Atari was in a mess and leaderless, and Warners, who owned Atari, wanted out and were looking for a buyer. Over in Commodore, Jack Tramiel had turned his company into a market leader of the home computer market. But by 1983, he left Commodore as he disagreed with some of the increased spending decisions that fellow directors were doing. After six months of leaving Commodore, Jack saw that Warners were looking for a buyer of Atari. 
Warners sold the home computing and game console divisions of Atari to Jack Tramiel for $50 cash and $240 million in stocks. Warners still retained the arcade division, calling it Atari Games, but they sold it to Namco in 1985. Over in the arcades, classic games were still being rolled out. In 1983, Atari finally brought out every kid's fantasy with Star Wars, allowing you to fly an X-Wing and play Luke in destroying the Death Star. Atari also did the great Crystal Castle game, which was a Pac-Man clone but in an isometric 3D viewpoint, and had a trackball for greater responsiveness. Nintendo and Shigeru Miyamoto in 1983 gave Donkey Kong's Mario his own game called the Mario Brothers. This game had Mario moving from being a carpenter to being a plumber and introduced his brother Luigi. The game itself was a one or two player game that had you stopping the turtles as they came out of the pipes. This year also saw the frantic shooter Gyrus. Konami also released Track and Field, the first real Olympic game if you don't count all the Olympic Pong games on the Atari. This game was a huge success, being addictive and competitively fun. But in 1983, Cinematronics Arcade Smash Dragon's Lair was the one that got everyone's jaws dropping. Using Laserdisc technology, a precursor to the DVD, the game had wonderful cartoon animations drawn by Don Bluth, an ex-Disney animator. Due to being on Laserdisc, however, it meant that there was very little interactivity with the gamers only able to move at the right time and direction to proceed to the next clip, otherwise they would die. The game might have been frustrating with being a trial and error, but for gamers, most would overlook it to simply enjoy the great cartoon visuals and humour. In the following year of 1984, Atari came out with more great hits. There was Marble Madness, a compelling isometric trackball game that had you direct your marble across an obstacle course. Invented by Mark Cerny, who had joined Atari this year only aged 17 after winning a game development competition by Atari. Paperboy was also released by Atari this year, and had you deliver papers successfully across a fiendish street packed with bizarre and humorous inhabitants who would block your path. Gamers loved it, with most kids having done the job and so relating to the game. Also, the game's cabinet with the handlebar controller made it even more fun. Yoshiki Okamoto, having now left Konami, and joined Capcom, released 1942, a great vertical shooter. This would put the final stamp on how vertical shooters should be, adding power-ups and frantic attack waves, and with subsequent vertical shooters released only being an extension to Yoshiki's vision. Namco this year would also come out with Pac-Lan, which would be based on the cartoon spin-off Pac-Man. This turned the game into a scrolling platform game, and had you take a fairy back to Fairyland. Data East this year released the first versus beat-em-up with Karate Champ, which had you fight your opponent to win. The game also had mini-games in between bouts to keep things interesting. Then there was IRM's Kung Fu Master, the first scrolling beat-em-up, which had you kick and punch your way through wave after wave of enemies to rescue your beloved one. Tenken this year would release Bomb Jack, a great fun game which had you play the superhero who must dash around the screen collecting up the bombs whilst avoiding the enemies. There was also Legend of Cage by Taito which had you play a ninja who must fight and leap his way through all the levels. There was finally Circus Charlie by Konami, a cute game that had you play Charlie the Clown and carry out death-defying acts for the benefit of the circus crowd. Well, I hope you enjoyed part 8 and will listen out for part 9 when Nintendo decide to release their own home console. So until next time, see you later.